welcome to Booklust. I'm Nancy Pearl. My guest today at University Bookstore is novelist Paula McLean. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for getting up at the, in the middle of the night. At the crack of 3 a.m. <laughs> right, to, to get here. I really appreciate it, and I know our viewers will, um, will enjoy seeing you in person. Wonderful. I'm delighted. So, your new book called Circling the Sun is um, a fictional biography of Beryl Markham. Is that how you would describe it? Or? Yes, yes. The way I've been talking about it is that it's a, another historical novel set in colonial Kenya and involving all the out of Africa characters because that gets people's attention right away. Right. Who doesn't love out of Africa? Right. Yeah. Although Karen Blixen is, is a very interesting character in here. Oh, she is. I mean, she was in real life. And, and she was, exactly, that. just a truly unforgettable woman. And it's nice to have these two unforgettable women sort of going head to head. So, Definitely. So this is the second biography, fictional biography, that you've done. The first, your first novel was The Paris Wife. Yes. So The Paris Wife is about the first marriage of Ernest Hemingway, and it's told from the point of view of his first wife, Hadley Richardson. You were trained, or you got an MFA in poetry. I did, I did. And it's funny to think about my whole sort of the arc of my, my career as a writer. It seems a little schizophrenic to me, you know? I did get my start in poetry and went to graduate school at the University of Michigan to learn poetry. That was my only ambition, was just to do that. You know, set up a little poetry stand by the side of the road. <laughs> get rich fast, yeah, right. writing poetry. Take this poem. Take yeah, this poem. please. Um, yeah, but when I was at the University of Michigan working um, on my first book of poetry, I often would have conversations with some of my other fellow writers and my colleagues in the program who, when they heard about my backstory, my own personal story, they would say, you should be writing a memoir. So the backstory is that I grew up in foster care in California in the 70s 80s, and 80s and spent 14 years of my childhood sort of bouncing through the California foster care system. Um, and I had never written prose before that, but I was very intrigued by the idea that I might write a memoir. And I thought, you know, what's the worst can, that can happen? I, I could fail. And I started working on that book, and that was sort of what changed my, kind of changed the arc of things. Once I started writing in sentences. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. Or, yeah. I mean, I, I, I wrote poetry, and, and when I was in my 20s, I, and lines used to come to me that were clearly part of poems mm. that I needed to put down. And then they stopped coming as poetry and started coming as prose. That is so interesting that you say that, because that's my exact experience oh. as a writer. Oh, that's good. And I, I just mean, remember I this so clearly, for instance, like being on the bus in Ann Arbor, sort of going from my workshop to my terrible little apartment and family housing. and a line would come to me on the bus, like completely whole. Right. And that would be the opening line right. of a poem. And that still happens to me today, where a line comes to me or a, a voice comes to me, but it's, it's prose. It's prose. It's so interesting. And it's interesting yeah. that you could tell the difference immediately. Mm. I, I always thought that was just mm. fascinating, mm. That, that you knew one, was, one belonged in a poem and one belonged in prose. Yeah. I think we have all kinds of transformations as humans, so why wouldn't we have it in our profession, you know? So as a writer, I feel like I've just gone through all of these thresholds where each new project suggests the next project. So I wrote a memoir, and I really loved um, writing about characters, mm -hmm. for instance, and writing in scene, and, and then suddenly I could tell a story, and tell stories that mattered to me, and I had no idea how much, how gratifying that would be. And then once that book was done and launched and in the world, and um, I thought, well, maybe I'll write a novel. And again, you know, what's the worst that could happen? I could fail. Right. You know, I could write a bad novel. And that, that took me, that book, that first book, which is called The Ticket to Ride, took me five years to write. Wow. Um, and I had little kids at the time, so it was particularly difficult. Yes. Um, so you have practiced getting up at 3 a.m. Indeed. Uh, to write. <laughs> indeed. And that time was so precious right. to me. And writer's block did not exist. If I had an hour a day to work on that book, that was the happiest hour of my day. So when, when you stopped writing poetry, 
Did you feel a loss hmm. in, in your life? You know, I did sort of feel a loss because I've been doing it for so long and reading poetry. Mm -hmm. Reading poetry is like going to church, you know, just the density of language. And I love words and what they can do and where they can take us. Mm -hmm. So something about the, the intensity of the experience of reading, you know, it doesn't ever come as uh, with as much force. Language never comes with as much force as it does in poetry. Right. So I do sometimes miss that. What I get to do now that I didn't get to do then, which has its own force and momentum and conviction, is tell stories and be swept away by a really good story and by an entire world. Um, and that has been the greatest surprise of my life, actually, that I would you know, start in poetry and end up a historical novelist, like really? And each thing, as I said, suggested the next thing. Mm -hmm. And it was just such a fluke. It was just such a fluke that one day I started reading A Movable Feast, which is Hemingway's memoir of his literary apprenticeship in those early days in Paris when he was a young man and he was a whippersnapper and he hadn't published anything. And he was newly in love with this woman named Hadley Richardson who I'd never heard of before. Um, but I had all these questions when I was reading *A Movable Feast*. You know, who, who is this woman? Why have I never heard of her? Right. And where did these two young lovers meet? And how did they get to Paris anyway? And then what happened that this golden couple um, sort of met their fate, and right. and uh, and the marriage fell apart? And Hemingway himself doesn't tell us any of this stuff yeah. in *A Movable Feast*. So it was just the engine of my curiosity. Wow. that led me to do research and then once I started doing research I just w became obsessed with Hadley and tr compelled to tell her story. So now, I, I always forget was it Hadley or Pauline who left the suitcase at the train station? <laughs> the famous Hemingway story that... Yes, the losing of the manuscripts on the train right. that was Hadley. That was Hadley. <laughs> that was Hadley. That was the ditzy move that Hadley then could never live down. Yes, and right. he never really forgave her for that. Yeah. Um, no, no. And that's what she's remembered for. And, and, and in fact, you know, when I started to work on the book, it seemed to me kind of um, a feminist act to take this woman who had been marginalized, who had been forgotten by history a little. Hemingway was such a big character and right. he eclipsed her. And if right. we remember her at all, it says that wife, right. the ditzy wife who left the manuscripts on the train. Right. And so it just felt a kind of a, like a powerful thing to reclaim her story and to, um, to shine a light on her experience, to exonerate her. Um, and she was really an extraordinary woman, Qu quietly, you know, her, her strength was, was of the quiet variety. She was very solid and very reliable and profound to his, the arc of his career. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I honestly believe that if Hemingway had not had Hadley during those early years to support him, absolutely, not just right. financially, but emotionally, then he could not have pursued his genius or become the writer that we know so mm -hmm. well today. Mm -hmm. So, And then a few years later comes Beryl Markham in Circling the Sun, the, right. the uh, main character of Circling the Sun, her story. Um, so how, where did that arise from, the interest in Beryl Markham? Well, you know, that was a fluke, too. So Hadley was... Life a, is a fluke, life is, <laughs> life is a fluke, and yet sometimes when things come along, they, it also seems like fate. Um, so like Hadley, I had never heard of Beryl Markham. Mm -hmm. Her name was familiar to me, but I didn't know why. And then, um, you know, after at The Paris Wife, it took me a while. I struggled to find another subject that would yeah, kind of I captivate to ask you about my that. imagination because something very special happened when I met Hadley. It's just like I said, it changed the arc of my career. Mm -hmm. But I had never been so absorbed by my own writing and by the act of, um, honestly, it just really felt like every day's writing was like climbing into a time machine. What did I know about Paris in the 20s? I lived in Cleveland. I wrote in a Starbucks in Cleveland mm -hmm. and uh, just felt whisked away and completely transported and absorbed, learning the history, learning about Hadley's life, becoming a, totally obsessed with Hemingway, reading all, all you know, everything he'd ever written and um, 
being deliciously absorbed by what Bohemian Paris, like what's more fun than that? Yeah, right. So then F. Scott Fitzgerald, F. Scott Fitzgerald Zelda, and Gertrude right, Stein right. and the Murphys and all these people are so fabulous and they're fascinating and Hadley, it was like falling in love. Mm -hmm. And then once that book was, was in the past, I didn't really know what to do um, and, and where I might turn. I knew I was going to write another historical novel about a real life historical mm -hmm. character but couldn't find a subject and struggled for years, actually. So who did you consider and reject? Oh my goodness, all sorts of people. You know, I had these fluke ideas like in the middle of the night, three o'clock in the morning. I started a book about George O'Keefe, uh -huh. who is one of my all-time heroes. Uh -huh. um, and I just couldn't, you know, I wrote hundreds of pages and couldn't get the, couldn't get the point of view and couldn't get the voice. And she lived such a big life right. and there were so many you know, periods in her life that had, you know, their own color and their own flavor and their own magic and um, that I just couldn't, couldn't get it. Mm -hmm. And then I started to work on a novel about Marie Curie. Oh. Yes. Wow. That yes. would be very exactly. interesting. Exactly. And who's yeah. more inspiring right. than Marie Curie? Yes. I mean, right. really. And I just thought, this is going to be fabulous. You know, I get to go back to Paris right. in 1894. There's a love story. There's tragedy. Yeah. You know, my it has it all. It has it all, um, and it sh totally should have worked, and yet that too didn't didn't work. And was it that you couldn't do a first person voice or with Marie? There was something about her that walled me out, and I don't uh -huh. know how to explain it any other way. Uh -huh. You know, when uh -huh. I was working on the book about Hadley, she invited me in. Uh -huh. I felt connected to her story. Right. I felt there was some quality in her voice. Her her consciousness, her humor, her everything was inviting me in mm -hmm. and gave me the confidence to take that voice and follow it to 1920s Paris uh -huh. and to know what she would be thinking right. and feeling. Yes. And for whatever reason, Marie's story was very compelling to me, but I couldn't get her voice, I couldn't get the point of view, and I was underneath my research. There was mm -hmm. just too much to mm -hmm. know, and I found that it became very precious to me. I think I know way too much you know, more than anyone should possibly know right. about physics in 1894. Uh -huh. um, but the dialogue was flat uh -huh. and the scenes were dead on arrival and I just couldn't bring that story And to you life. could tell that when you were writing, you would reread something and, and just sort of yes. win, wince and say, yeah, not Yeah, it wasn't working. even, it wasn't just even in the rereading, it was in the writing, writing. that I mm. felt detached and there, mm -hmm. that there was a distance between myself and the material and a distance between myself and the scenes. It's, it's sort of the, it's like being kicked out of heaven. Right. You know how the, the, the most delicious feeling is when you look up and four hours have gone by right. and you've been working and just gone. Right. You know, yeah. just yeah. completely yeah. removed from your. Removed and right. completely absorbed and swept away. Yeah. And that was the experience of the Paris wife and writing about Marie Curie was the mm -hmm. opposite. Um, but that was my failure. It wasn't her failure. That was for whatever reason. Right. I couldn't. Just, I just couldn't right. attach. Right. Well, I, I mean, I think we become friends with people. You know, there's something kind of ineffable that you. You. Why are you friends with this person, or why do you like this person? It's. It's the same thing when you're looking it's for a subject. Absolutely. Yeah. It's mysterious. We don't know why we connect right. to certain or right. to certain books. Why certain books move us and. And others, others don't. don't. So circling the sun is out and um, selling very well. Congratulations! Thank you. Happy about that for Thank you. Thank you. Um, what, what are you thinking now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking that it's really fun to do this part of it, which is to go out into the world and to share Beryl's story with people who aren't familiar with her. Right. So, um, as I said, she was a total fluke to me. Um, I was lost. And then uh, a couple years ago, I was on vacation with my sisters and my brother-in-law in Orlando, Florida. And my brother-in-law is a doctor, but he's also a pilot. And that weekend, as we sat by the pool in Orlando, he was reading oh, this West, book called West, West Within, Within Night by Beryl Markham. And I'd never heard of the book. And he mm -hmm. kept looking up from the side of the pool and, and having this look in his eyes like, you know, you need to read this book. This woman is absolutely amazing. And she's really inspiring. And she's going to matter to you. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I ignored him. Um, I usually ignore my brother-in-law. But um, 
he ignored me right back and shoved the book in my hands and said, no, seriously, this is going to be important to you. And I took it home, and it actually sat on a shelf in my dining room for a year and a half after that while I was struggling with Marie. Mm -hmm. And then one day I picked it up and read one paragraph, uh, a moment from Beryl's childhood, and was completely transported. Mm -hmm. It was like what you were talking about. A line comes to you, and you know you're writing. Same thing, for whatever reason, it struck a chord and it completely captivated my imagination and I didn't know who this woman was but I knew I was going to write about her and that was it I just that was it that was and then you you went to Africa you went to Kenya to do some research I did go to Kenya but I didn't go to Kenya to do research and I know that that's counterintuitive but so when I started working on this book I just felt like I wanted to I wanted to give myself permission to just explore that world imaginatively and to not have the restrictions of the real right. and the actual and you can't go to colonial Kenya. Right. Nairobi is a city of four million people now with high rises and yeah. neon signs and bomb squads and in Beryl's day it was tin shacks and you yeah. know goats and right. eucalyptus trees and red dust and it was nothing it was like Africa, untamed Africa yeah. and I wanted to just learn about that world through her consciousness and you know I had this wonderful book I had West with the Night and she talks particularly about Africa so beautifully and it's really such a gorgeous book and you can tell that that Africa because she spent her childhood there really got under her skin mm -hmm. and changed and changed her but if you read, have you read West with the Night? Oh, yes. 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 Okay. Yes. So you know if you read West with the Night, we have Beryl's adventure. So what she's known for historically right. is that she was the first woman to fly the Atlantic east to west solo in 1936. And then she had all these other adventures. She was the first licensed female racehorse trainer in the world when she was only 18. She was a bush pilot. She was one of the first women um, in the world to have a commercial pilot's license. And she just did all of these things that women didn't do right? Such daring and nerve and pluck and, and all that comes through in West with the Night. But what's missing is all the other stuff. Where's the vulnerability and where's Beryl's personal story? Right. right. Um, and I was really compelled to go looking for her because she leaves all of that out. And then there were, I mean, I would just come to each moment and go, I can't believe that happened to her. So if you read West with the Night, for instance, you have no idea that when Beryl is four years old, her mother picks up and returns yeah. to England from Africa, yes. abandoning her, and, and, and she and becomes this. Yes, and totally, I mean, basically totally abandoning her. Disappears. Disappears yeah. from her life, reappears briefly, and asking, in Africa, asking for help. You describe yes, 16 that. 16 years later. 16 years later, mm -hmm. but then nothing. Yeah. Um, so you don't know that's part of right, Beryl's story, and, right. and I attach to that because that's my story mm -hmm. as well. So right. I was four years old as well when my mother yeah. picked up and left. And, um, and my mother did come back into my life too, exactly 16 years later. So there was no way yeah, that I was gonna read leave. this detail right. and not then think I understood something about Beryl's well, I, I, story and yeah. her consciousness. And, and her um, determination to succeed, which I think, I, you know, I think if you, if you've been abandoned, I mean, she was abandoned by her mother, as you say, when she and brother, mother took the older brother, leaving her right. with her dad, mm -hmm. and then the dad basically saying, you know, we're moving, get married because I, I can't. Right. I mean, that's two big abandonments. I mean, they were some years apart. Yes, exactly. Two crushing losses. Two crushing losses, mm -hmm. and I think that in some ways, I mean, I mean, this is maybe too much psychoanalyzing of someone who was long part. dead. Oh, That's okay, okay. Part. But you know, I think she was trying to overcome. She was trying to show them. Exactly. That she, you know, like thumbing her nose at them and saying, look what I accomplished. Exactly. The ferocity of her pushback. Yes. Right? Yes. Like, and the way that she kind of forges an identity as an underdog, as someone who will then confront these impossibly dangerous things. She gets an appetite for risk and for an intensity of experience. And to me, yes, it is psychoanalyzing her, but how can we not? 
think right. that that's how you, the world creates a Beryl Markham. Right. right. Yeah, absolutely. And you've been so, um, in, in these two books, I mean, th reading them, you've just been incredibly, I don't want to say lucky, but you made such wonderful choices because it's not just the people. It's not just Hadley but it's Hadley in 1930s Paris, or 1920s Paris. Which is completely fascinating is as a world, this right. bohemian right. kind of enclave and all those characters right. are so fascinating to us and that world is, and yes, you're right, that, that sort of the same, there's a correlative in this world too. Now we're in bohemian, Right, right, Nairobi. Right, right. And here exactly. are all these expats. And, and we always think that, um, I, well, I, I think that one of the one of the things I most enjoyed about Circling the Sun was remembering how it brought back other books that I'd read about Happy Valley, isn't that what the Happy Valley set and the things that went on in in that? And we think, you know, we we, we these days think we've invented all of those, <laughs> uh, you know, all of when that. When really they were far <laughs> they more were, yes. experimental. Absolutely. And yes, yeah. they were burning it down. But you have these two great great um, settings um, that 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 in that enrich the novels you know and I mean, build the world and build the world mm, and I think you. that yeah, yeah you're welcome no and again I do feel lucky too to have stumbled on this world that I was unfamiliar with and how delicious you know I, I taught English for 19 years, I taught out of Africa. Mm -hmm. I, I have whole chunks of it memorized and the whole book is dog-eared <laughs> and underlined. And, and guess what? Beryl Markham's not in that book. Yeah. But she was in Karen Blixen's world. Yes. So in those years before, um, you know, Karen wrote about her experience as Isak Dinsen in Out of Africa and Shadows in the Grass. And, you know, she lived in, in that world and was part of Beryl's set. And in fact, the two were rivals for the affection of Dennis Finch Hatton, the safari right. hunter who privately I call Robert Redford. You know? <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> In the dark of the night you call. In the dark of the Dennis night. Dennis Robert. Um, yes. Hemingway became somebody not entirely admirable. Would you go that far? I would go that far. Okay. Absolutely. It seems to me that, you know, when Hemingway moved to Paris as a young man, he had the the most pure of ambitions, and it was beautiful that he just wanted to be up in his garret writing right. um, his one true sentence at a time. And the um, regret that's palpable in A Movable Feast, which he wrote at the end of his life, but mm. about the beginning of his life, is that he realized along the way that he started to drink the Kool-Aid. You know, mm -hmm. he started to believe all the hype about himself, that he was right. a genius, that he could make his own rules, and that he, you know, abandoned Hadley along the way, but he also abandoned himself mm -hmm. and was completely swallowed up by ambition and, and lost greatly because of that, absolutely. And yes, became a character, became a figure that we don't like very much. Now, do you put Dennis Finch Hatton, um, Beryl's lover and Karen Blixen's lover in that same in that same character that we don't um, admire for his relationships. You mean is he a dirty rat? The same way that Hemingway is a yeah, dirty rat? Yeah, I mean let's he's... cut. Uh, yeah, <laughs> let, let, let's let's cut. Let's get to the bottom of this. Right. So I do seem to be fated to write about love triangles, right? So here's Hemingway in love with two women, right. you know, Hadley and Pauline, and right. what kind of scoundrel? betrays his wife to have this affair. And similarly, I guess it is, you know, kind of the same story. Here's a man who's in love with two women and his longtime lover and partner, Karen, right, sort of is thrown to the wayside for this young chippy, Beryl Markham. Young but it's chippy. not, it seems to me that when I started to write about a love triangle this time, I, I, I just let myself uh, be a little more accepting of the fact that love is complicated. Do you know what I mean? It's like I learned something along mm -hmm. the way and the blinders had been pulled off, you know, living with the Hemingways for several years from the inside out. And, and love is, can be pretty complicated. And, and do I think that Dennis is a dirty rat? No, what I think about Dennis is he was a free spirit 
and he wasn't really for the having. You know, he wasn't monogamous, he wasn't traditional, he wasn't a conventional person, and so how could he love conventionally? Mm -hmm. I do believe that he was um, as true as he could be to himself, first and foremost. And I actually see that Beryl is that person too, that Beryl was, was faithful most to herself. She wrote her own rules, she lived by her own code, she wasn't, she didn't really fit in her world. She wasn't, um, she wasn't a conventional woman. Uh, that, that to me, Hemingway's and Dennis Finch Hatton behavior in the, in the two books, um, they're so selfish. Uh, you mean and by... And maybe I'm too harsh. Yes. You mean because they couldn't commit to a monogamous because relationship? Because partly they, that mm -hmm. or partly because it was all them. Right. And I and I don't know. Uh, um, it just was interesting when I was reading the, the book to compare it, uh, which is why yeah. I love to read. No, me too. And I think if I sympathize with him, it's because I've written from his point of view. I've written his dialogue. Mm -hmm. I've tried to climb right. into his head. And for a writer, it's almost like being an actor. Mm -hmm. And that if you are trying to get into your character, the worst thing you can do is judge them. You actually have to start from a position of compassion right. and empathy, and it becomes more an exercise and just trying to get as close as you possibly can to understanding why they do what they do. It's just that, it stops there. Why people make their bad decisions, that's what I try to, mm -hmm. to sort of, to, to sort of un, you know, uncover as a writer. Um, and whether or not I would make those decisions Really doesn't, doesn't enter, enter into it. It really it. doesn't enter yeah. into it. Yeah. yeah. Paula McLean, thank you so much for being on Book Lust. Thank you, Nancy. Yeah.